everybody, Brett Rice with Core Vision Financial Group coming to you today again with another video in our financial topic series. Today we're going to be focused on end of year tax planning and today we have a special guest, Rob Yen, who's going to come in here and talk to us about some things we should be thinking about as we get to the end of the tax year. So today it'll be myself, Brett Rice, Brent Thoman's in here and then we have uh, Rob Yen. So we're going to give everybody an opportunity here to introduce themselves. So Brent, you want to introduce yourself? Uh, thank you, Brett. Uh, my name is Brent Thoman with Core Vision Financial Group. Um, we've had the business here for starting on six years. I've been in the business for 22 years, started with my father. Hi, I'm Rob Yen with uh, Brammer & Yen Professional Corporation. We're a CPA firm here in Shelbyville on downtown on the Circle. I've uh, been in the tax and accounting area for since 1993. Uh, bought the firm in 2003 with along with Brian Brammer. Um, we're a full service accounting firm. We do uh, payroll, bookkeeping, and accounting, and then a lot of tax planning for individuals and small businesses. So I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me today. Yeah, thank you for being here. This is your, we were talking this morning, this is the first time we've interviewed somebody in person that's not a, a core vision person. Oh, wow. I feel honored. <laughs> Almost exactly a year ago, we interviewed Ryan Dietrich from LPL, but he was on Zoom. Uh, other than that, almost every time it's been core vision people. You know, we interview, we've interviewed each other multiple times. I think Andrea and I've done six of these videos together now, so they get they get to a point we're glad to have somebody else. So the idea uh, in this today was to get some ideas or you know kind of think about what are some opportunities for people as we come up on the end of the year when we start thinking about okay, it's time to get our stuff ready for taxes. You know what. Do we still have time that we could do that could help out with our taxes or what should we be looking for next year to do to help our, our taxes? What are things that we may not traditionally think about that we maybe need to be looking into as far as our taxes are concerned? So uh, what we're going to do now is we're just going to rapid fire some questions out here to Rob and see how he deals with this. <laughs> So in your opinion, Rob, as we come to the end of the year, what is like, you know, I don't want to say the basic, but like where should people start when they start looking at end of year taxes? Like what are things that they should say, hey, did I, have I done this? You know, what, what are opportunities out there or things that people really need to make sure they're looking at? Well, there, there's a lot of opportunities out there, especially I think for small businesses, uh, and, you know, agriculture, small businesses. There's a lot of things we can do. And right now about late October, early November is really when we start getting into our full uh, year-end tax planning mode. Um, we try to look at where you're at ahead of time because once December 31st comes along, basically all we can do is report what's what's already happened. There's not a lot of planning and strategies that can happen after December 31st. But as long as we meet prior to that, you know, in November, December, um, we can kind of sit down and do a, do a brief snapshot. Of, okay, here's where we think you're at today. What can we do to try to minimize those taxes? And that can be anywhere from, you know, making a contribution to your uh, IRA, um, you know, looking at prepaying expenses, looking at your capital gains, capital losses, trying to determine, you know, do we want to match those up? Uh, do we need to sell? Do we need to buy? Uh, there's really lots of things. It really just depends on the individual circumstance and where they're at as far as what, what we need to do for them. Rob, let me ask you a quick question here. Um, we, like you said, there's some things December 31st that uh, after that there's not much you can do. There's some things after up until the tax filing. Um, can you give me just a couple examples of the deadline of December 31st versus the actual tax of April 15th or 17th, whatever it is this year? So, so traditionally, um, you know, you have there's a once your uh, RMD requirement comes in at 72, that has to be done before December 31st. So that's a very important deadline because there are penalties uh, if you do not take that RMD. And like I said, that that has been changed. It used to it was 70 and a half. Now it's 72. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is in the year that you turn 72, you do have the option to carry that over and take that first distribution by April 1st of the following year. Um, but if you do that, then you, you have to, you'll have to take two in that following year. So you kind of keep that in mind. But that is a hard December 31st uh, deadline. 
As far as your regular, traditional, or Roth IRAs, uh, those are April, well, normally April 15th. Tax, <laughs> you know, whatever the tax deadline is that year, April 15th, 17th, whatever it is, or in, in last year's July 15th. Yeah. So, uh, but, there, but that is not uh, a case where you can, you have until the extension deadline. It has to be the, uh, the tax deadline for that day. Um, but as far as one of the things I like uh, is with the SEP IRA, you do have until uh, the extension deadline to make that contribution. So if you own a small business, you know, you've had a really good profit that year, you're wanting to defer that, uh, you know, one of the things is to talk with your tax professional and your financial advisor and see does a SEP make sense because it does give you a lot of time in order to generate cash flow to make that contribution and help reduce, reduce the costs with that. Another hard deadline, December 31st, is your charitable contributions. Um, those have to be made, you know, before December 31st, um, and you need to get a written receipt in most cases from the charity that uh, that you you know made that contribution. Another hard one is the uh, December 31st is your college choice, the 529 contributions. And I know early on we had some some issues with that. People were waiting to the very last. You know, day or two to make those contributions. They weren't getting it into the system correctly, and there was a lot of notices. I think they've got that somewhat resolved. But my recommendation is make those contributions early. You know, by mid-December, um, that helps both you, the financial advisor, uh, and make sure that you can get that in for that for that year. So you just touched on a bunch of topics there that I think uh, are super important to people and we want to make sure that you know people are asking the right questions and, and looking into that. And I think one of the things I want to make sure we talk about is recently, uh, also, I think it was last year, right? The standard deduction change or was it two years ago? Two years, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, standard deductions change. They definitely increased that quite a bit. Um, so, you know, Fewer and fewer people are, are doing the itemized deductions. I think for for 2021, standard deduction uh, is around 25,000 for a married filing joint and 12,550 for single. Uh, so that's one of those things where you know you try to decide: Are we better off doing the standard deduction or taking the itemized deductions? And basically, it just comes down to crunching the numbers. You know, you look at Here's my itemized deductions, which typically your itemized deductions include um, state and local income tax payments, your real estate tax payments, excise tax on your vehicle registrations, you've got mortgage interest, charitable donations, and then sometimes uh, you got medical. If you have enough out-of-pocket medical expenses, you, know, you can count those as well. So, kind of what you do is basically just take all those numbers together. If they add up more than the standard deduction, you want to take them. If not, um, you're going to take the standard deduction. Um, so the one thing to keep in mind when you're looking at that though is again, a couple years ago they changed the rules. You used to state and local taxes and property taxes, all those, you could include all of them. You know, whatever the amount paid was, you could deduct. Now they've capped those at $10,000. So even if you paid, you know, $15,000 in state taxes, you know, you paid 3,000 in property taxes, you're gonna be limited to 10,000 total on that. So uh, that's one thing where you gotta kinda keep that in mind. So um, again, I'd say in, in most cases, probably 80% of our clients are, are probably taking the standard deduction now. Now one thing that we have done that, that kinda helps, um, there are some cases where Maybe you're close to being able to itemize, you just can't quite get there because the standard deduction is so high. Is what we do is we, we kind of bunch our, our itemized deductions together in one year. So one year we may say, okay, you're gonna, I'm going to go ahead and make you know, my charitable contributions for 2021. And then in December, we'll go ahead and make their 2022 contributions to where enough that we can get up over that standard deduction and help get higher amount. And then in 2022, they're not going to really have much, so we're going to take a standard deduction. And we alternate again. So it's kind of one of those years where you alternate between itemizing uh, one year, standard deduction the next. That can help save you some money there. Um, but again, that's 
it doesn't work quite as well anymore because when they cap that the state and local taxes at ten thousand, um, we're not a, used to. We would do the donations and also be able to prepay our state taxes as well. But uh, with them changing that, uh, but it can still, in certain circumstances, can can. So, so you're anybody who's like not sure just needs to do the math. Yeah, basically, I mean, either they do the math or if they have a tax advisor, yeah. you know, that's doing the tax return, you know, give them all the information of all those numbers and then they can run the numbers and see. And again, you know, if we, even if you're not there, but you're close, as long as you give them the numbers, then they can, they may be able to look at, hey, is, is bunching going to work for us or, or are we just so far away, at, you know, it's never going to work. Uh, a lot of that really comes down to the charitable donations, you know, how much they have there. Because if, if, if they don't have a lot in that, then they're probably not going to be able to get to that. So I'm clear. So when you're talking about your state and local uh, income tax and your property tax lumped together, $10,000. Correct. Correct. And your excise tax on your vehicles. All those, mm -hmm. all your state, local um, property tax, excise, all those taxes together are going to be capped at $10,000 maximum right now. Uh, Rob, let's uh, let me ask you a little bit about HSA contributions. I know a lot of those are through work, uh, but some people don't uh, fully maximize those. Get deadlines. How's that work? And also with the FSA, uh, either contributions or what the rules are of rolling over over a year or not rolling over HSA versus that FSA. So with the HSA, um, I really like HSA plans. I think they come in handy because most people, you know, they don't have enough out-of-pocket med. In order to have enough out-of-pocket medical, it's got to be over like seven and a half percent of your income, uh, and then you still have to have enough to itemize above and beyond that. So very few people have enough in medical expenses to be able to to use those. So with the HSA, the way that works is, you know, you either you as an employee or your employer can contribute into those for you. Typically it's both. Uh, employer a lot of times will put a little bit in and employee can have money taken out pre-tax out of their paycheck. So that's an advantage because in, a, in effect, you're basically being able to use pre-tax money to pay for those out-of-pocket medical expenses. Uh, so one of the things that I look at when preparing a return is, okay, we've got, here's the maximum amount you can put into the HSA, which for a family this year is $7,200 and a single is $3,600. So what we'll look at is, okay, here's the maximum amount, look at the W-2, how much has been put in so far, which may only say it may only be a couple thousand dollars. Well, they have room where they can they can actually write a check for the difference and put that in and get that as a deduction on their tax return. And typically, again, that the deadline on that is whatever tax day is for that year. So that can come in handy as a kind of a you know, if, say somebody you know owes eight hundred or thousand dollars on their federal tax really don't want to pay it, um, you know, they can fund, go ahead and fund that HSA contribution, either max or whatever they need to, they feel like they can do, can be a big benefit at times. So, and then the FSA, I don't see that quite as much anymore because of the HSAs coming in. So, um, but they are still available. Uh, there are some, that that is a use it or lose it typically. Um, again, with some tax law changes last few years, you are under certain circumstances allowed to carry some over, uh, depending if, if the plan has been changed and modified. So there are some times where you can carry some over, but not very much. The HSA, the nice thing about those is, you know, you don't have to use that money up. It can carry forward, and it's, it's a nice way to set up, you know, a nice fund available for when you retire. Typically, your medical expenses go up. Um, and you can have that set aside there. So uh, for 2021, I think the 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 health portion of the SS, FSA is like $2,750. And uh, there's also a de dependent care portion of the SF, FSA, and that's maxed out at $5,000 for the year. Yeah, Rob, uh, earlier you, you touched on uh, capital gains and capital losses and using them to offset each other or, or to use those for tax efficiency. Can you also touch on capital gains, short-term, long-term, and how those can impact taxes as well? Sure, sure, sure. So, um, you know, capital gains and capital losses can, can have a big impact on your overall 
financial plan and, and you know, on your tax strategies as well. So one of the things to keep in mind is if, if you have, say you sold stocks or even real estate and you have a large capital gain that year, you might want to you know, talk to your financial advisor, uh, have them look over the portfolio and see if there's any investments that are maybe at a loss right now that we can take those losses, what we call harvest those losses, and use those losses to offset the capital gains that you have either in um, the account, other capital gains, or maybe even outside that with real estate or farm ground or whatever. So that's something that keep in, in mind. Now the one thing you have to look at when you're looking at capital losses is we have what they call a wash sale rule. So if you sell a stock for a loss, then you have to wait at least 31 days to buy that back, uh, that same stock back, or the wash is disallowed. You can't deduct it. So that's something to keep in mind is, you know, sometimes you, you might have a stock that is at a loss currently that you want to use that to offset those gains, but you might think long term it's going to be, it's going to do well. So what you do is you can go ahead and sell it, take the loss to offset your capital gains, then also look, you know, wait 31 days and, and buy that back, and that way you still got it in, in the portfolio, but you've been able to harvest those losses. Uh, as far as long-term and short-term, um, you know, the IRS looks at it as if you own the stock or the mutual fund, whatever, for at least 12 months, and it's considered long-term, and if there's a gain on that long-term, then it's, it's taxed at a lower capital gain rate which is typically 15%, or in some cases, depending on your income level, can be 20%. Um, if, it's, if you own the stock or the mutual fund for less than 12 months and you have a gain, it's considered ordinary income and it's just taxed, again, whatever your ordinary income is, whether it's 15, 20, 25%, depending on where you're at. So the key difference is you, if you're gonna have a gain, if you can, you wanna hold on to it for at least 12 months um, to get that lower lower capital gain rate. Rob, can you expand a little bit on the 529 and the tax credit? We've talked a little bit about the deadline, but can you uh, maybe expand on uh, the advantages of that, especially with the comes to taxes? Especially with the comes to taxes. Sure. Uh, you know, with the College Choice 529, there are some, some big tax advantages with that. Uh, one is you can get an Indiana tax credit up to $1,000 off your Indiana taxes uh, the credit, how that's calculated is it's a 20% credit on what you put in up to a maximum $1,000 credit. So once you've funded $5,000 into the account for the year, then you've qualified for that $1,000 credit. Now, you can put more than the $5,000 in. Uh, you're not going to get any more credit, but there's still some advantages to that in the fact that all the earnings that are in that 529 are tax-free as long as they're used for you know higher education purposes. So uh, you know again, and that credit is non-refundable, which means if your if your Indiana tax amount on the return is only seven hundred dollars, then you're only going to get up to seven hundred dollar credit. So you're not going to get more than that. But um, in most cases, you know if you have over a thousand dollars in tax liability, you'll get the full thousand dollar credit on that. And again, I think um, one of the things to keep in mind is when you're looking at pulling money from the 529, you know, kids are in college or trade school or whatever it is, and you're now you're looking at pulling some money out of that, you can use it for tuition, books, um, supplies, and room and board also qualify for that. So any of the money that's used for those items, um, the earnings come out, they're tax-free, uh, is, is a big advantage there. Let me ask you a question. We, we get this question quite a bit. What if my son or daughter doesn't go to school? Um, what are the tax, uh, lack of a better term, what's the bad tax ramifications for that uh, if they don't? Well, they uh, they well, they have a couple options with that. One is they can continue. Um, they could either transfer that that account to, to another child. They can hold it for grandchildren. Um, you know, there's lots of options. They can use it for a niece or nephew, whatever. So there's lots of options. Now, if they decide that you know what, we just don't really have anybody that's going to use it, we're just going to go ahead and pull it out. Uh, it will be, you know, the earnings will be taxed. Now, again, the the amount that they put in is not taxed because it was not deducted 
when they put it in. But the earnings would be taxable, and there's a penalty on top of those on that earnings. So my recommendation is, you know, you know, try to maybe hold on to that account for a while, see if there's going to be grandchildren or another child that would use it. Uh, if not, though, they do have the capability of pulling it out, but there will be taxes and penalties on top of that. Yeah, one thing I've talked to a few people about is they didn't establish a 529 to save money, but to use to pay for college expenses mm -hmm. to just if you're going to pay it anyway, why would you not funnel it through there? Let it sit there, you know, a day or two, and then take it and just right. pay it right out. Yeah. So again, one of the huge not funnel it through there. Let it sit there, you know, a day or two, and then take it and right. Pay it right out. Yeah. So again, one of the huge advantages is that Indiana tax credit. I mean, if you're going to spend, you know, say your son or daughter's a freshman in college, and you didn't put any money away ahead of time, but you are wanting to help them out. If you're gonna help them out, run it through the 529, get the credit. Now, the one thing I would keep in mind is, you know, you want to, you got to keep that account open. So you want to put probably a little more than 5,000 in it, just to have that balance, and then maybe pull 5,000 out because you want to keep the account balance open. Um, but yeah, that's a great, great option. Is you know, if you're gonna pay for it, run it through the 529, definitely. So kind of as we're getting towards the end of the year and there's all this chatter about tax changes and, uh, you know, potential new tax laws that are coming into effect and, you know, there hasn't been any movement on it yet and there's all this talk about it. Uh, what are some things that people need to be making sure that they're paying attention to, you know, as far as what people are talking about for new tax laws? Well, the problem with that is those, until it becomes law, it changed, you know, it's changing on a daily basis. So every day, you know, you read, here's what's been proposed, this has been proposed. Um, so I honestly don't get too wrapped up in these proposals. I try to keep an eye on it, so obviously, so I know, you know, somewhat what's going on. But when, when those are changing from day to day to day, it's really hard to wrap your head around what should I do. And, and that's why it's very hard. It's been very hard over the last few years to, to really plan not only for income taxes, but for estate planning, because the rules are changing. Even when they set the rule, you know, two years from now, is it gonna change again? So I try to avoid getting people locked in to certain things just because something might happen, uh, because again, we, we don't know what's gonna be. Uh, but, you know, some of the things they are talking about doing is um, increasing capital gain rates, which again, a lot of these things I think are gonna be for the, upper class, you know, 400,000 or higher income levels. Um, I really don't think the middle class, if you're under 400,000 in income, I, I don't know that they're, we're going to see, they're going to see a lot of changes. Uh, but, you know, capital gain rates potentially could go up on, on the higher income earners. Um, they are looking at reducing the estate tax exemption, right? Currently it's like 11.7 million per person. Um, they are talking about changing that. And what I keep reading is I think it's going to end up somewhere around $5 million in that area. So, you know, a couple could each have $5 million. That's $10 million combined. Again, I think a lot of people, that's they're still going to be okay. I mean, obviously it will affect more people than it does now, but I still think the majority of people will probably be okay. One of the things that was brought on early on was um, doing away with step up. In basis when you you know so currently the rule is if if you own it, uh, investments or real estate any assets like that and you pass away the the, the uh, basis gets a step up to the, whatever the fair market value is on that day so for example if you bought a stock and say at twenty dollars a share and now when you the day you pass it's worth a hundred dollars whoever inherits that stock now has a basis of $100 per share, so they could turn around the next day and sell it and have zero, zero capital gains on it. There was some discussion about maybe doing away with that. I think that's kind of gone away now. I, I, I mean, I think they'll keep that step up basis. There was a lot of, uh, you know, feedback, negative feedback on that. So I'm not sure that that's going to probably come into play here. Um, but yeah, I think the, you know, the cost basis thing, that was a real concern, but I, hopefully that's not gonna happen. The other thing there's talk about is, you know, we have what's called the backdoor Roth IRA conversion, which um, is where 
you put money into, you know, if your income is over a certain level, you're not allowed to put directly into a Roth IRA. So a workaround with that is you contribute money into a traditional IRA first, which is going to be non-deductible because your income level is too high. But then you convert that traditional IRA over to a Roth, and it's kind of a backdoor way of getting it in. There's been talk about doing away with that, and again, that could happen, but I think that might be, again, if you're over 400000 um, that may go away, but if you're under that level, then hopefully we'll still have that opportunity to be able to do that. That's a good way to um, you know, get money into a Roth that you traditionally can't do that. So Now, one thing to be careful when you're looking at those backdoor Roth is um, if you have other IRA money that's already pre-taxed, there's, that can cause a bit little of a problem, and we've run into that before, uh, people not realizing that. So if you've got other money in regular IRAs that are pre-taxed and you try to do the backdoor Roth, it, it doesn't seem to work quite as well. Um, you can still do it, but it, it's not as tax advantaged as, as it would be if you didn't have those other monies. But that doesn't. So when you talk about you're talking about the traditional, it doesn't. If you have 401k, that does not affect Correct. just the traditional yes. IRA or a rollover IRA from an old. If you have any of those, that's where the backdoor Roth IRA does not work as well. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. In 401k, that doesn't matter. Um, but it's just a traditional IRA or, like you say, inherited IRA or something like that that has pre-tax money in it. Um, probably not going to work very well for it to do that backdoor. You know the problem is once they do the plan, a lot of times it's too late. To, it's kind of like you're in a you're in a you know yeah. a tough situation because you don't want to do something that might happen, but then if you wait until it happens, it might be too late. So it's just it's it's very hard to do planning right now uh, for anything really because you know the rules are changing all the time, and uh, you know my my theory is let's do with, with the best we can with what we've got. And that's all we can do. You know, I don't want to lock somebody into doing some kind of irrevocable trust or something because the state law might change. Well, if it doesn't change, now you, you know, you're kind of stuck in that. Right. So we just kind of see what's happening, keep our eye on the ball. Um, and then once you know, changes are made, we try to figure out you know, legally what's our best options we can do to try to minimize the impact for them. Rob, can you give us a little bit of information, kind of at a high level view of, let's say, for small business or maybe that one person is self-employed, uh, about the different type of business structures and maybe a little bit of how you guys go through the process of what might be the best for the business, uh, tax side, because each one of them is tax different, maybe just a high level of that, if you just a few uh, sure. minutes. And that's a that's a case by case basis. Obviously, there's no one size fits all. Um, so what we do, and like if I have a business owner, or a new client coming in, wanting to set up some kind of new business structure, so we'll sit down, we'll look at okay, you know, for are you going to have other employees? What kind of income do you think you're going to make the first few years? Um, do you want to be set up on payroll, or do you want to get what's called you know? guaranteed payments or draws. So, so there's a lot of things that we look at, um, liability issues, you know, what kind of business is it? Is it a high liability type business that, that you know, there could be a lot of lawsuit potential there. So basically, uh, for most small businesses, there's, I would say, three options. There's, you can just go with the simple self-employee, uh, which is the easiest way to get set up. You basically just you know, you start operating as a business name. There's no corporate structure. There's no LLC structure, partner, anything like that. It's just you go out, you start your business. Um, the other second option would be what they call, the, which is the limited liability company, LLC, which is very common now. Uh, that comes into play typically if, you know, you want to have more of a, a, a more formal type structure, uh, LLC. It gives you some protection from a liability lawsuit. Uh, then there's what's most common probably today with an operating entity is called the Subchapter S Corporation. It's where you set up a corporation, um, you file with the IRS to be taxed as an S Corp, which is a what we call a flow-through entity. The, the corporation itself does not pay income tax. The income flows through to the shareholders and they pay the tax on their individual return. Um, 
but that's an avenue where they they would be treated as an employee they would get a salary and then they would, could also take out dividends so it's really a this is something that's more of a, a bigger conversation that we'd have to have and sit down but those are kind of the options that you would have available to you yeah also uh we talk to clients all the time about reviewing their retirement plans through work or you know the self-employed about contributions to that and how that has an impact on their taxes you know we we recommend to people you know as they as they progress through their career they increase their contributions over time and review it annually to say hey did, you know did i get a raise this year should i increase my contribution uh is that a conversation that you have with people during tax season Sure, yeah, because so when we're doing their tax return, obviously we have the W-2 in front and we can see exactly how much they're putting in, deferring into that. You know, one of the options we look at is when they come up and say, well, you know, you know, sorry, you owe $800 in federal tax this year. They're like, well, what can I do to, you know, to correct that going forward? And, and the first thing we look at is, okay, how much are they putting into that 401k or simple or whatever it is they have through work and try to, you know, try to maximize that as much as they can. Obviously, you know, that's based off of cash flow, what they can do, but uh, that's one of the easiest ways to uh, be able to save on their deferred taxes is, is by putting into that company retirement plan. Obviously, you, at least the minimum you want to do what the company match is. You know, I, I see people sometimes aren't even doing up to what the company matches, and I'm like, you're giving, you're just leaving money on the table. So. Um, you know, you want to look at that, um, but yeah, looking at, and the other thing to look at is now, uh, as you guys well know, the Roth 401ks are becoming more and more popular. Uh, so that's something to consider. Am I better doing the regular 401k where I'm getting the tax deferral now, or do I want to do the Roth 401k where I go ahead and pay the tax up front, but the advantage is all the earnings that are in that come out tax-free on, on the back end. And I personally, a lot of times, will recommend doing a little both. I really like having that option of doing both in there because at retirement, then it gives you uh, flexibility of pulling some money that's already pre-taxed, money that's not been taxed, you know, or, or that's going to come out that's going to be taxable. That can also help when you retire, looking at your Social Security benefits as far as how much of those are taxable, because anything that's coming out that's you know, from a regular 401k, it's going to be taxable. That could increase how much of your Social Security that's taxable. Whereas if you have an option that, you know, with the Roth that's not coming out taxed, it could really benefit down the road for you. Real quick, we, all three of us sitting here talking, and maybe just a real quick explanation of how does the 401k pre-tax, how does that actually work just for, let's say, the layperson may not understand is we keep telling them to put that money in, it helps tax-wise. Just a real quick of how that helps, like what's that? So, so, so basically it, help, it, it is a deferral. So when you put money into that 401k through work, um, you know, let's say you make $50,000 and you defer, you're putting 5,000 into the uh, 401k, now you're only paying tax on 45,000 instead of the whole 50. Uh, that money goes into that account. Hopefully, it grows and grows and grows. And then, when you go to retire, you know, you start pulling out. When you go to retire and you pull that money out, anything that's in a regular four hundred one k or a traditional IRA, that all comes out as taxable as ordinary income. So it's not like you're putting money in and you're, and you're saving the tax. You're deferring the tax now. The advantage though is, so if you put $5,000 into that 401k and that saves you you know, $1,000 in taxes right now, that gives you extra money to work with that normally would go to the government. So you've got that deferral works, plus you've got the growth, the deferred growth in there. So as long as it's in that qualified retirement plan, you're not paying tax on that earnings each year. Whereas in a traditional, just traditional investment, um, you know, you might, you've got two or 3,000 in capital gains on that, you're gonna pay tax on that every year as that goes through. With a retirement account, it's deferred until you go to pull it out. And in a lot of cases, you know, again, that uh, not always the case, um, but when you retire, sometimes you might be in a lower bracket. Or even if you're in the same bracket you were when you're working, at least you got the deferral side of it. So very rarely probably are you going to be in a higher bracket, but it, it can happen as well sometimes. 
Okay. Well, thank you. I just wanted to make sure we take for granted sometimes when we talk about how that works. And we have clients ask us, well, you say we defer, what's happening? Well, yeah. You're lowering your income from this year when you put that in there. Yeah. So. One of the things we got, we got to realize as advisors is, you know, we work with this every day. To us, it's common knowledge, and, and it's really important to sit down with your clients and and and, and be in their, put yourself in their position. You know, I don't deal with it. We need to really explain to them how these things work so that they understand and, and can go into it knowing exactly what that, that, that rule is. Well, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Great explanation. I, I really appreciate you talking about the different buckets to have the different types of yeah. you know tax treatment on those different assets. So that way you have flexibility and options in retirement. So you're not immediately like, oh, well, everything I have has to be sure. taxed. Yeah, yeah. It's a great idea. Rob, tell us a little bit. Uh, this this year was a change on the child tax credit, uh, where you would get this at the time uh, doing your taxes. Now this year you're getting a portion. I think it's fifty percent. You can. Uh, <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong, but can you take, explain a little bit about what's going on here? What are they doing, and what to expect that tax? Yes. Yeah, so, so the child tax credit, what they've done is they, uh, in the past, that child tax credit was two thousand dollars per child, and what they've done is they've increased that. So children under five, that credit is now thirty six hundred dollars, and if you're over five, then the credit's three thousand dollars for twenty twenty one. So what they've done is they're saying, okay, since you're going to get that increase, they started giving out these advanced credit. What they're doing is they're giving out the extra portion as an advanced, as an advanced credit to you. So in most cases, you know, for one child, you might be getting, I think it's $166 a month or whatever. Um, so that's basically just taking care of the extra credit that you're going to get above and beyond what was originally set. So it really shouldn't affect it. If when you file your 2021 return and you qualify for those credits, then um, it really shouldn't affect your taxes that much because you're still going to get the $2,000 credit you would have gotten originally, like like you had in the past, and you've already gotten the gotten the extra credit. So that's now where it could come in and hurt is if, say, in 2020 you qualified for that advanced credit. And they started sending out that, those monthly uh, checks to you. But then in 2021, say your income goes up quite a bit and you don't qualify anymore, then you may have to pay some of that back. So that could be that could have a big impact for you. So uh, typically, if your income is less than $150,000, you, know, you should qualify for the full credit and it probably won't have any impact on you. So, but that's that's how that's worked. They've increased the credit and they're giving part of it back to you early. The rest of it you'll still get when you file your 2021 tax return. Well, thank you, thank you for that explanation. Um, Rob, tell me, or talk a little bit, just real quick, about the charitable contributions from an IRA um, and the non-tax they can be. We can just explain that just a little bit. Sure. So uh, with qualified charitable distributions, then basically anybody that's required to take their required minimum distribution can have up to $100,000 uh, given away to a charitable organization. And the advantage of that is it, it's not shown as, as, as income to you. So for example, if you weren't able, weren't going to be able to itemize, then you know giving money to a charitable organization is still a great thing to do, you know, for a great cause. But it's from a tax standpoint, it's not going to help you. If instead of writing a check, you said, okay, I'm going to have that money come from my IRA as a qualified charitable distribution, then let's say, for example, your required minimum distribution say is twenty thousand dollars, and you want to give ten thousand of that away. Now you're only paying tax on that ten thousand that's left that you actually pulled out. The ten thousand that was given to the charitable organization is not taxable to you. So in effect, you're able to deduct it by not reporting it as income. Now the key to that is the money has to go directly from the IRA to the charity. You know, you can't get the check and then decide to write a check to them. That doesn't qualify. So it's very important to work with your financial advisor ahead of time. Uh, letting them know here's where I want you know my money to go to for the qualified charitable distribution, um, and then they will write the checks uh, you know to those charities. The other thing to keep in mind is when it's time to do your taxes. So at the end of the year, when you do pull money out of an IRA, uh, you get a 
it's called a 1099R form that shows here's how much was pulled out, here's how much the gross, here's how much is taxable, and then if there were any taxes taken withheld from that. Those 1099Rs, for some reason, they don't report how much of that was given to in a QCD. So you've got to notify your tax professional how much of that was going so that we know to put it on the return correctly. Because if we don't know that, you know, we're going to assume it all came out to you, so the full, you know, the full twenty thousand would be taxable instead of just, you know, the ten thousand they actually received. So that's kind of a key factor too. Hey Rob, thank you again for coming in, taking your time to answer these tax questions for us as we approach the end of the year. You know, uh, tax topics will become top of mind to everybody. So we really appreciate you taking the time. Again, Rob's contact information will be at the end of this video if anyone wants to reach out to him to uh, talk to him about tax questions, tax preparation, any of that. Again, Brett Rice, Brent Thoman, uh, Core Vision Financial Group. Our contact information will be at the end. Thank you for watching the video. We appreciate it very much.